thank God for his mercy and for his grace and his compassion. <clears throat> you know, um, this week I, I, I had been looking on the subject of beholding Christ, beholding Christ, you know, um, for the past two weeks, we were looking at Revelation 12 and we were looking at the great controversy, how it progressed uh, from before the creation, from in heaven, and as it progressed uh, down to our time, and what needed to, to be accomplished by Christ in order for sin to finally be eliminated from this world. Um, this week, I want to take some time to look at uh, our Savior Christ and his mission and what he accomplished for us, and hopefully it will allow us to uh, you know, get a glimpse of who he is, his love, and we may see God for who he really is, uh, a God of love, a God of mercy, a God of compassion. And most importantly, we will recognize how, how much value he has placed upon us and that we will fully commit our lives to serving him, to appreciating him, to loving him. So just bow your head with me while I invite God's Holy uh, Spirit to be with us in this journey. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your mercy and grace, for your love that you have shown us time and time again. We thank you for your holy words, O oh God, and for the wisdom of your Holy Spirit that helps us to understand your word. Open our eyes, O oh Lord, open my eyes, open my lips, and that as I speak, the words that I speak may be a blessing to someone, and that we will truly come to appreciate, to love, and fully serve you as our God, as our Savior, as our King. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, so, behold in Christ. Uh, when, when we look at the book of Numbers, in the travels of ancient Israel, in the book of Numbers, uh, chapter 21 specifically, ancient Israel came to a point in their journey where they began murmuring against Christ. And uh, God essentially withdrew his protection, and the Bible says fiery serpents started to bite the children of Israel, and many of them died, and they cried out to God, they repented and asked for forgiveness, and in the process, God told Moses to make a fiery serpent of bronze, put it on a stick, and anyone who was bitten that would look upon it would live and not die. Christ drawing uh, an analogy from the same uh, from the same experience, he says, "As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up." And so, by looking unto Christ, is where we are saved, is where we are we are given life, so to speak. Think on these things. 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18, the Apostle Paul speaking, he says, But we, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So the transformation of, of, of our lives day by day is something that happens in the passive. What I mean by that is the word is we are changed. In other words, we do not change ourselves, but we are changed. In other words, it's an act that is, is done to us and not something that we do. However, the part that we play in this transformation process is that we must behold with open face. We must behold as in a glass, the glory of God. So the idea behind this is very similar to the idea of a thermometer. The, ch the change inside of the thermometer is accomplished by influences from outside of the thermometer. So therefore, by beholding Christ, we have control over how we spend our time, over what we allow to pass our senses, but once we allow that influence, then that influence now changes us. And so when we behold Christ, when we sit before him, when we spend time to look into his beautiful face, then we are transformed into that same image. 
1 Peter 1, verse 10, the Apostle Paul, he says, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify when it testified beforehand of the suffering of Christ and the glory that should follow, unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us did they minister these things, which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. So the Apostle Paul is here saying that the salvation that we are enjoying right now the, the prophets have inquired and searched diligently into those things. So when you think of the prophet Isaiah, he wrote about the mission of Christ as the suffering and dying Messiah. When you think about uh, Malachi, when you think about Micah, when you think about um, even Jeremiah, the various prophets of old, when they spoke about Christ, you know, even in the Psalms, they diligently searched the scriptures that prophesied of the Messiah to come, right? And when they prophesied those things, the Apostle Paul is saying those things that they prophesied, they did so for us, according to verse two. They ministered those things for us, right? But not only that, the Apostle Paul is saying that all of those prophecies, all of those revelations concerning our salvation even the angels themselves desire to look into these things. In other words, our salvation and the process by which we are saved is not just something that's going to benefit us. It's something that will be, as it were, a lesson book to the entire universe, including the angels above. And this is a marvelous, marvelous sentiment. Now, I came across an article and the article was talking about 15 reasons to stop believing in God. And it was a, a, the voice of an atheist. That's the, 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 I think the website from which it came, the atheist voice. And the 15 reasons that he gave, I have narrowed it down basically to these uh, summaries. The first one was God's omniscience negates free will. In other words, he's saying, because God knows all things, he knows what you're going to do. He knows whether you're going to be saved or lost. Therefore, how can you have free will when God knows everything? That's one of the first reason. Second reason, he says, was God couldn't prevent the first murder. In other words, if he were God, he would step in and not allow the first murder to happen. Number three, if we are God's best creation, what a waste of space. In other words, he's looking upon humanity and he's saying there's so many things that are better than us as human beings. In other words, the, I, the, the, the value that he places upon the human being is very small. And, and this is not a surprise because when you, when you uh, disbelieve in what the scripture says as to our origin, that we are made in the image of God, then you, what you are left with is the theory of evolution, which basically says we came into being from nothing. We are just uh, an, in, a small speck that just exploded into, into what we are. So there's little value placed upon mankind if you believe in the idea of evolution, right? Number four, it says God, number five, actually, oh, number four, virgin birth. And he says, really? With modern medicine, maybe. So the idea of, of, of Christ being born to a virgin, he mocks at it. Um, number five, God seems to agree with all Christians, even though they disagree with each other. Number six, he says the Bible is just filled with contradictions. Seven, in God's image, if we are made in God's image, why then so much failure? In other words, he's not taking into account the sin factor that we were made perfect with free choice. And this was the choice we chose. He looks at the Holocaust and he's saying, if God is truly in existence, why would he allow something as dreadful as the Holocaust? 
And uh, next reason he says, God doesn't exist because I said so. In other words, his words is to be taken with more value than the words of God himself. Religion has made life worse for the most part. In other words, according to his understanding, there's more evil that has been done in the name of religion, in the name of, 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 of Christ, so to speak, than good, according to him. Number, the next one is science versus God, God loses. Then he points out natural disasters, points out that God tortured and murdered his own son. Now, it's fascinating how he puts that one. And then the last one, he says, burn him forever in love. In other words, he's saying, if God is a God of love, why would he burn sinners forever? Now, for those of us who are Christians and who have come to believe in Christ and come to know him as a God of love, these 15 reasons to stop believing God are seen to be just, uh, just a bunch of uh, uh, excuses to avoid coming to grips with the reality. So these reasons that are given here, when we truly understand who God is and the plan of salvation, then these reasons really make no sense. In other words, for example, that God tortured and murdered his only son. In other words, the choice to die for a sin, Christ made that free choice. In other words, it wasn't God that says, okay, I'm gonna take my son and kill him. It was a choice, a, a decision between the father and the son. The Bible says God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. So it was a joint union to redeem the world. You follow what I mean? So as we move on, we're going to take time to look into the, 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 the um, plan of salvation as it is. And many of these questions that have been asked, many of those objections as to why we should not believe in God will just simply fade away as we truly understand the plan of salvation. Now, there are many questions that even the atheist has to come and, grip, uh, and, and grapple with. Number one, why am I here? What is my ultimate purpose? Are we bound to destroy ourselves? So even as an atheist who chooses not to believe in God, there still is a sense of emptiness within them as to these questions, as to what our ultimate purpose is and why we are here, okay? Now, in the book, Desire of Ages, page 19 to 20, I wanna read a statement, it reads, but not alone for his earthborn children was this revelation given. In other words, the salvation, the mystery, the plan of redemption was not given for God's earthborn children alone. Our little world, notice that. In other words, our world is essentially just a speck in the creation of God, a speck. It says, our little world is a lesson book for the universe. God's wonderful purpose of grace, the mystery of redeeming love, is the theme into which angels desire to look. It will be their study throughout endless ages. Now notice what it calls. It says the mystery of redeeming love. The idea behind it is that it is love so deep, so broad, so high that we have a hard time understanding why a God who, has, who is all powerful will still allow his creatures the freedom of choice to choose to serve him or choose not to. Generally, when you think of power, persons in power don't offer that free will to others who are under their sub subjugation to do whatever they want. You can serve me or you can know. The opposite is usually seen where power forces the will by fear, by oppression, by whatever means to come into subjection. But God, our God, who is all powerful, has chosen a path that is a mystery, the mystery of redeeming love. And it says this will be our study through endless ages. In other words, it will, it will, it will take that long 
for us to truly understand the mind of God. Both the redeemed and the unfallen beings will find in the cross of Christ their science and their song. Their science and their song. It will be seen that the glory shining in the face of Jesus is the glory of self-sacrificing love. So the true glory of God and who he is will be seen in his self-sacrificing love. At the very bottom, it says, in the light from Calvary, it will be seen that the law of self-renouncing love is the law of life for earth and heaven. And that the love which seeketh not her own has its source in the heart of God. So in Corinthians 13, 1 Corinthians 13, the description of love, it says, love seeketh not her own. Now, if God is love, he cannot but help. He, he, he cannot but ex exemplify a nature that is selfless and that gives to others, so to speak. It says, and that in the meek and lowly one is manifested the character of him who dwelleth in the light which no man can approach unto. So in other words, when Philip says unto Christ, show us the Father, and he says, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father, what Christ is here, what this reading is here saying is that the self-sacrificing love of Christ in willing to die for our sins is a reflection of who the Father is. And that is a beautiful statement. Now, the paradox is easily resolved. Omnipotent yet loving. Now, when you understand that, you understand why God had to allow free choice. And why in the course of history, he had to allow mankind to continue to make their free choices. Desire of Ages, page 22, it says the exercise of force is contrary to the principles of God's government. He desires only the service of love and love cannot be commanded. It cannot be won by force or authority. Only by love is love awakened. Think about that, brethren. God is here saying that only by showing us love can love within us be awakened in turn for him. The plan of our redemption was not an afterthought, a plan formulated after the fall of Adam. It was a revelation of the mystery which have been kept in silence through times eternal. Romans 16, verse 25, the revised version. It is an unfolding of the principles that from the eternal ages have been the foundation of God's throne. From the beginning, God and Christ knew of the apostasy of Satan and of the fall of man through the deceptive power of the apostate. God did not ordain that sin should exist, but he foresaw its existence and made provision to meet the terrible emergency. So in other words, even though God is all-powerful, he's all-knowing, sin, sin did not take him by surprise. In other words, God foresaw it. And as a result, he also uh, uh, put in place a plan of redemption that would allow uh, redeeming mankind from that fall and allowing us to be able to be on a, on a vantage ground that puts us in a better place had we had not sinned. Now, it's amazing because many would have asked the question, if God saw that sin was to come into being and it would be as terrible as it is, why did he proceed in making man? Why did he proceed with, with, with creation? Why, why, why even make Lucifer to begin with? If he foresaw all of these things that would happen. And you see the beauty of it is because of God's all-knowing majesty and power, he realized that with free choice will come risk the risk that you will choose to disobey him. And he was willing to deal with that risk, to go through the plan of salvation so that his true character might be fully revealed so that 
when this world is fully redeemed, the Bible says affliction shall not rise a second time. So the only security against sin is by us truly knowing God for who he is and seeing the plan of salvation fully played out. And that will secure all creation from that point forever, that sin will not arise a second time. Now, in the book, Story of Redemption, page 42, speaking of the plan of redemption, inspiration says, the anxiety of the angels seemed to be intense while Jesus was communing with his father. Now, the context of this reading, Adam and Eve had sinned. And now the plan of salvation was to be put forward in, in progress. And she says, three times Christ, he was shut in by the glorious light about the father. And the third time he came out from the father and his persons could be seen. His countenance was calm and free from all perplexity and doubt and shone with benevolence and loveliness such as words cannot express. He then made known to the angelic host that a way of escape had been made for lost man. He told them that he had been pleading with his father and that he had offered to give his life a ransom to take the sentence of death upon himself that through him man might find pardon and that through the merits of his blood and obedience to the law of God, they could have favor the favor of God and be brought into the garden and eat of the tree, of the fruit of the tree of life. So the plan of salvation, even though it was from the foundation of the world, it still involved pleading with the father. And it's not that the father was unwilling, as we will see, but it, 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 was, it was not a decision that was made lightly. A bittersweet experience. Now, the same reading continuing on page 43, it says, at first the angels could not rejoice for the commander concealed nothing from them, but opened before them the plan of salvation. Jesus told them that he would stand between the wrath of, the father, of his father and guilty man and that he would bear the iniquity and scorn, but few would receive him as the son of God. Nearly all would hate and reject him, and he would leave all his glory in heaven, appear upon the earth as a man, humble himself as a man, become acquainted by his own experience with the various temptations with which man would be beset, that he might know how to succor those who should be tempted, and, fin and that finally, after his mission as a teacher would be accomplished, he would be delivered into the hands of men and endure almost every cruelty and suffering that Satan and his angel could inspire wicked men to inflict. That he would die the cruelest of death, hung between the heavens and the earth as a guilty sinner, and that he would suffer dreadful hours of agony, which the angels could not look upon but would veil their faces from the sight. Not merely agony of body would he suffer, but mental agony, that which bodily suffering could in no wise be compared. So the angels could not rejoice at first because the plan of salvation involves two things. It involves justice and mercy justice and mercy and it's amazing because the two things usually are, op are are in opposition to each other in other words justice requires that the penalty for sin has to be executed and the penalty for sin bible says the wages of sin is death and so death had to be satisfied but mercy also provided that man should, should that a way should be provided that man would not have to suffer the consequence of his sin. So Christ had to die in order for man to have mercy. And so both mercy and justice was satisfied in the plan of salvation. When the angels heard this on the same book, 
Story of Redemption, page 43. Inspiration says, the angels prostrated themselves before him and they offered their lives. Jesus said unto them that he would by his death save the life of many, that the life of an angel could not pay the debt. His life alone could be accepted of his father as a ransom for man. So notice that the life of an angel could not pay the debt. It could not satisfy the justice of the law of God, right? Jesus also told them that they would have a part to act, to be with him at different times and strengthen him. He would take man's fallen nature, notice that he would take man's fallen nature and his strength would not even be equal with theirs, the angels. Jumping down, it says that they would be witnesses of his humiliation and great suffering and that as they could witness his suffering and the hatred of man towards him, they would be stirred with the deepest emotion and through their love for him would wish to rescue and deliver him from his murderers. Notice that. It says when they behold what he would have to go through, the emotions of their heart would be so stirred that they would, they would feel like they, they have to step in and rescue their redeemer. The taunting on the cross. If he is the son of God, let him come down and save us. The spitting in his face, the beating, the crucifixion, the rejection, even when you think about it. Human nature, when John, the apostle John, saw how the Samaritans rejected Christ, he said, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven and consume them? In other words, out of the anguish of his heart to see how they were treating the Messiah, his savior, he wanted to just wipe him from the face of the earth. And here inspiration is saying the angels with all the power would feel certain emotions where God had to warn them. It says, but that they must not interfere to prevent anything that they should behold. So inspiration, God told them, you cannot step in to interfere and that they should act a part in his resurrection and that the plan of salvation was devised and his father had accepted the plan. So only one equal with God could actually satisfy the claims of the law, satisfy the, the penalty of death. And so the question, can there be a self-denial with God? Christ was fully God. And so by Christ himself uh, uh, suffering, so to speak, the penalty of death, he fully satisfied the law, which was equal to himself, okay? And that's an amazing plan of salvation. No, no. It was not, it was even a struggle with the God of heaven, whether to let guilty man perish or to give his beloved son to die for him. And when I read the statement, I, I cannot but ponder. And this is something I guess I would, I would look forward to talking with Christ and to talking with the father when man is redeemed. What was it like? It says, even with the God of heaven, it was a struggle, whether to allow sinful man to perish or to give his only beloved son. The transgression was so great that an angel's life would not pay the debt. Nothing but the death and intercession of his son would pay the debt and save lost man from the hopeless sorrow and misery. Nothing but the life of God himself. Adam and Eve. Now, when the plan of redemption was relayed to Adam and Eve after they had sinned, notice the reaction of Adam and Eve in Patriots and Prophets, page 63. The sacrifice demanded by their transgression revealed to Adam and Eve the sacred character of the law of God. In other words, when they realized that 
by simple disobedience, they would now forfeit life itself. It was at that time that they realized how serious the law of God is. But we have many today that say the law of God is done away with. Now, if the law of God could be something that could be just thrown out, why would there be need of a plan of redemption? They could have just thrown out the law of God and Christ need not have died. But the sacredness of the character of the law of God must stand vindicated. It says they saw as they as never before seen the guilt of sin and its dire result. In their remorse and anguish, they pleaded that the penalty might not fall upon him whose love had been the source of all their joy. Rather, let it descend upon them and their prosperity. So Adam and Eve, when they realized that the sinless one, Christ, who would walk in the Garden of Eden in the cool of the day and talk with them, when they realized that in order for them to be saved, he must come as man, suffer, and die the most cruel death, Adam and Eve pleaded that the plan of salvation must not be carried out. Pleaded that let, let them bear the penalty. That is how much they felt sorry for the decision that they had made. That is how much they loved Christ. Desire of Ages, page 25. But it says, by his life and his death, Christ has achieved even more than recovery from the ruin wrought through sin. Notice this. By Christ's life and his death, it says he achieved more than just redemption. He achieved more than just forgiveness. He achieved more than just buying back sinful man and putting him back on a place where he was before. It was Satan's purpose to bring about an eternal separation between God and man. But in Christ, we become more closely united to God than if we had never fallen. Think about that, brethren. So the plan of redemption, the question that was asked, if Christ knew that, uh, uh, that Lucifer would sin, that Adam would sin, that Eve would sin, why go through the whole process? Because in the end, we would be placed on a vantage ground. We would be closer to Christ than if we had never been, never fallen. That is amazing, brethren. That is absolutely amazing. Now you think about this and you may say, well, that makes no sense. But the question that Christ posed to Simon at the feast, when Mary Magdalene washed his feet with tears, he said, Simon, there were two that were forgiven. One was forgiven a great sum and one was forgiven a smaller sum. Which of the two would love him more? You remember that question, brethren? And the answer was, he that had been forgiven the most. So the idea is when we see the love, the depth, the height, the width of God's love and what he has suffered for us, our love for him would be such as it would never have been had we not seen that side of God. In taking our nature, the Savior has bound himself to humanity by a tie that is never to be broken. Through the eternal, eternal ages, he is linked with us. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And I say, amen, amen. In Romans 5, the Bible says, reading from verse 1, uh, well, we're going to read verse 1, 2, 5, 9, and 10. It says, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Verse eight, but God commanded his love or commended his love to us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Notice that he died for us while we were yet sinners. Now in verse 10, it's gonna bring it out even stronger. It says, much more than 
being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For when, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So the plan of salvation was a plan that Christ was going to be dying for enemies, for his enemies in order to bring us peace again between God and man. And it is amazing because it says, where sin abound, grace did much more abound. So the depths of sin, the wretchedness of sin, however deep it is, the Bible is telling us that grace is much deeper. Not just a little bit, it's a, it did much more abound. So the redemption, my friends, places us on a, on a vantage platform that is higher than the depths of which sin had taken us. And that is amazing. Now, Desire of Ages, page 26, it says, rebellion can never again arise. In other words, many people think that when Jesus returns the second time and we are all changed in the twinkling of an eye, that that change is a change that we will never again have free will, that automatically we will just do what is right and pleasing in God's sight, as if God is going to take away our free will at that point in time. But his nature never changes. God is a God of love, has been a God of love, and always will be a God of love. So even when we are given redeemed bodies, we will still have freedom of choice. But the difference is our minds would have come to a point where we would have seen the effects of sin and where we would have seen what it took to redeem us and that we would come to a point where all sympathy for sin and the law and breaking the law of God will be uprooted from us. And that is what will secure us from apostasy. Notice what inspiration said. Through eternal ages, all are secured from apostasy. How are they secured? By the love's self-sacrifice, the inhabitants of earth and heaven are bound to their creator in bonds of indissoluble union. So what it is that prevents us from falling into sin and apostasy again? By love's self-sacrifice. When we see the plan of redemption played out, when we see what Christ has done for us in order to buy us back, that in itself creates within us such a love that we choose, brethren, not to violate the laws of God because we in turn love Christ that much. And so when Christ says, the, the, on the law hangs, it says all the law hangs on what? Love to God and love to your fellow men. So the law of God is all about love. And therefore, love is what will preserve us from breaking the law in the future. The Bible says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And so in the future, when we are fully redeemed, we will keep God's commandments because of the love that we have for Christ, because of the love that we have for God. And that love is a self-sacrifice in love. Continuing the highlighted portion in the middle, the earth itself, the very feel that Satan claims as his is not only to be ransomed, but exalted. Our little world, this speck under the curse of sin, the one dark blot in his glorious creation will be honored above all other worlds in the universe of God. So not only will we be placed on vantage ground, not only will we love him more, but our little world, this lesson book, inspiration is saying, will be placed higher than all the other unfallen worlds that have never sinned. Here, where the Son of God tabernacle in humanity, where the King of glory lived and suffered and died, here, when he shall make all things new, the tabernacle of God shall be with men and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people 
and God himself shall be with them and be their God. In other words, this little speck of a earth will become the capital of the universe. God will rule the universe from our little remade world. Brethren, that is, that, that is amazing. Now, rules of engagement. In Romans 3, verse 24, we touched on this earlier, that brings out a point that justice has to be satisfied at the same time that mercy is satisfied. Now, the Apostle Paul understood this concept. And so in Romans 3, verse 24, he says, we are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation, and that word means a payment, through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. So in other words, Paul is here saying that the, the, the penalty of sin received its full payment. And that payment was in the blood of Jesus Christ. And so in verse 26, he says, now Christ might be just because he satisfied the full justice of the law and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. In other words, the merciful redeemer of those who believe in Christ. So he satisfied justice. So he was just. And he was also a justifier. In other words, the one that offered mercy from the penalty of sin to others. And so at the cross, justice and mercy met and was fulfilled. Now, let's look at how the plan of redemption had to, had to go about. So when we, when we look at Christ, the Bible says we behold Christ. Now, when we behold Christ, we behold him in two forms. We behold him as God. And we behold him as man because he was fully both, right? So let's look at how we behold Christ as God. In the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 1, if you have your Bibles, please turn there. That way you can follow along in your Bibles. In the book of Hebrews, in verse 3, the Bible says, Who be in the brightness of his, the Father's glory, and the express image of his person. So in other words, Christ was essentially everything that God himself was, though being a separate and distinct person. So he was the express image of the Father. In other words, he was in all essence exactly like the Father, right? Verse 4, it says that he was better than the angels, right? Who being made so much better than the angels. In other words, he was creator of the angels. That's how much better he was than the angels, right? In verse 7, it says that he was creator of all things, right? Not only did he create just the angels, but he was also creator of all things. In John 1 verse 3, uh, also adds more information that, to that. It says, uh, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was with God. It says, all things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. So not only was he creator of the angels according to Hebrew 1 verse 7, but he was creator of all things created, right? In Hebrews 1 verse 8, it, the father is speaking and the father calls the son, thy throne, O God. So essentially, in essence, Christ is God. The word was with God and the word was God, right? In Colossians 2 verse 9, it says, In Christ dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So there was nothing that was in the Father that was absent from Christ. He was in all respects equal with God. Philippians 2, verse 6, that is a, a very good one. Philippians 2, verse 6. He says that Christ thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Now, robbery is when you take something that does not belong to you. That is theft. But here the scripture is saying Christ being equal with God was his right 
It was his. It was not robbery. Right? And John 10, verse 30, I and my father are one. So when we see Christ, Christ is essentially everything that the father is. He, he has all the, the abilities of divinity. He is omnipowerful. He is, is all powerful. I'm sorry. He is all present. Is all knowing, is all the things that make God who God is. And there's a whole host of other passages that speaks of the divinity of Christ. When you go to uh, the Old Testament, when you go to Isaiah, when you go to um, um, Micah, when you go to um, even, even uh, in the days of Moses, right? When Christ referred to himself as I am, what Christ was saying, I am the eternal ever existing one there's not a past there's not a future there's just i am just always in existence that's the phrase i am and the jews knew exactly what he meant because their reaction was they took up stones to stone him because he had made himself equal to god so christ is in all respects equal with the father okay but in order for him to, to, to redeem man, the plan of redemption required that he became as man. And we're going to see why that was important in the plan of redemption. Because in rules of engagement, in warfare, there are certain things, there are certain guidelines that must be followed, especially by a God who is a God of law and order. So in this great controversy, Satan can use deception, he can use lies, he can use all the things that God cannot use. God has to remain true. And so in the plan of redemption, the plan must fulfill all justice at the same time it's fulfilling mercy. And so God has to follow the rules of justice. And so in the plan of redemption, it involved Christ becoming man. And we will see why in a, in a little bit. Philippians 2 verse 6, it says, who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Now pause here for a minute. Notice in the previous slide, it uses the phrase, the express image or the likeness of God. And what that phrase meant was that he was in every way exactly like God the Father, right? And so the phrase, the likeness of men, does not mean similar to men. What it means is exactly like men. That's what the, the, the phrase likeness of men connotates. It's not saying that he came in, in something that is similar to what man is. He came as man. Verse 2, verse 8, it says, and being found in fashion as man. In other words, exactly identical to man. He humbled himself. Notice that. Now, humility and divinity don't go hand in hand, so to speak. In other words, when you think of God, he's always highly exalted. And humility is our response to his exalted nature. But here now, Christ, as man, humbled himself and became obedient. Notice that phrase, obedient. In other words, when one is in charge, he gives the rule. When is one in subjection, he obeys the rule. So he humbled himself, became subject unto death. Notice that. Now, the quality of divinity is that divinity cannot die. In other words, it always existed and will exist forever. But here we find Christ as man subject to death, which meant that he is fully just like me, subject to death. But not just any death, even the death of the cross. Now, why is that important, even the death of the cross? We'll see that a little bit in a little bit. Now, in the phrase that we just read in verse 7, it says that Christ made himself of no reputation. When you look at what that word means in the strong concordance, kinu, 
It translates in this manner to empty yourself, to make empty. It's spoken of Christ. He laid aside equality with or the form of God to make void, to deprive of force, to render vain, useless, or of no effect. Causing a thing to be seen, the last part, cause a thing to be a thing to be seen to be empty or hollow or false. Now we know false is not the application here, but the idea is everything that made Christ divine, he laid it aside. He made it void. He deprived himself of it. He rendered it vain and came as a man. Now, let's look at some of uh, uh, in scriptures where we see the fulfillment of this. Okay? In Psalms 50 verse 10, the Bible says, For every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle upon a thousand hills. I know all the fowls of the mountain and the wild beasts of the fields are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell thee, for the world is mine and the fullness thereof. That is divinity speaking. Christ in Matthew 8 verse 20, listen what he says. And Jesus said unto him, the foxes of holes, the birds of the air have nests, but the son of man hath not where to lay his head. So he has gone from one who owns everything to, a, to one who does not have, even have a place to lay his head, to call his own. Isaiah 53, verse 2, it says, As a root out of a dry ground, he hath no form or comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty in him that we should desire him. He emptied everything that we would even consider of value. In other words, when you look at even his very birth, he was born in a stable. And we see pictures today of these stables that are, are, are kind of cleaned up and made to appear a, a, a beautiful place. But in reality, brethren, for those of us who are familiar with farm life, a stable is not the nicest place. It smells, it's dirty, it's filthy. It's where animals dwell. And that is where our savior, king of the universe, owner of all things, made his entrance into this world. So he emptied himself of all that dominion and power. Let's look at all knowledge. Psalms 139. David in his song, he says, uh, it says, thou, O Lord, thou hast searched me and has known me. Thou knowest my down sitting and my uprising. Thou understandest my thoughts afar off. In other words, inspiration made it clear that sin did not surprise the divine. And here, David is carrying out the same thought. He says, before I even think the thought, you knew it and understand it, it afar off, even before it became a thought. Thou compasset my path and my lying down. Thou art acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, our Lord, thou knowest it altogether. Thou hast beset me behind and before and laid thine hand upon me. Such knowledge is just too wonderful for me. It is too high. I cannot attain it. The eyes of the Lord in Proverbs 15, 3 are in every place beholding the evil and the good. So in God's eyes, there's nothing hid. He knows all things from the beginning to the end, our thoughts. In Psalms 159, David says, even when he was being formed in the womb, God knew the smallest parts and he, he brought them into existence, into existence. He says he numbers even the hairs of our head. Now, when you look at Christ growing up in Nazareth, Desire of Ages, page 70, it says, Jesus secured his education in the home. His mother was his first human, in, human teacher. From her lips and from the scrolls of the prophet, he learned of heavenly things. The very words which he himself had spoken to Moses for Israel, he now taught at his mother's, mother's knee. 
he was now taught at his mother's knee. He learned a trade and with his own hands worked in the carpenter's shop with his father, Joseph. And Hebrews 5 verse 8, it says, he learned obedience by the things he suffered. So here we see Christ learning even the very things that his own mouth had spoken to Moses. He now had to learn it just like me, just like you have to learn. In other words, he emptied that, that, that all-knowing nature and made it, laid it aside so that he can become as one of us, right? And what about all present? Psalms 1, one um, I believe this is supposed to be 159. I think, uh, let me double check. Psalms 159, I believe it is. And David is speaking of, of, of the passage I just quoted with um, how God knows all things, you know? Now, if you look at verse 9 and verse 8, Let's start from verse 7. It says, Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or where shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend into the heavens, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me and thy right hand shall uphold me. So there's no place where we can go where God's presence, where his divine presence cannot go. It is correct. So it's 139, Psalms 139. So it is correct. However, looking at John 16, verse 17, when we see Christ as a man, he says, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. So Christ speaking to his church, he's saying, it is important that I go away so that the comforter may come. Now, why is it expedient? The uh, inspiration commenting on it in high places, 337. It says, it is expedient for you that I go away. No one could then have any preference because of his location or personal contact with Christ. The Savior would be accessible to all alike, spiritually, and in this sense, he would be nearer to us all than if he had not ascended on high. Now all may equal, be equally favored by beholding him and reflecting his character. The eye of faith sees him ever present in all his goodness, grace, forbearance, courtesy, and love. As we behold, we are changed into his likeness. So when Christ was on earth, his presence was limited. He, he, he would be seen by his disciples and those that were nearer to him. But the divine presence is not limited. It can be everywhere at all times. So we see that Christ emptied even his, his omnipresent nature and all power. Isaiah 40, verse 28, it says, Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainted not, neither is weary. Notice that, brethren. There is no searching of his understanding. So our God, he does not faint. Neither is he weary. In fact, it says he giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increaseth strength. But yet still, when we go to John, John 5, verse 30, Jesus says, I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek it not mine own will, but the will of the Father that has sent. So Christ confessed that as a man, he could do nothing of his own self. He was tired. He rested. He wept. He was weary. All the things that this verse in Isaiah 40 is saying that the divine God does not experience. And so we realize that Christ had to empty himself of all power in order to accomplish the salvation of man. 
Now notice that the phrase in John 5 verse 30, it says, because I seek not mine own will. What do we call one that carries out the will of another? We call him a servant. But that word servants translates in scripture to the word slave. It is one that carries out the will of another. And that is what Christ is here saying. I have become a servant or a slave, so to speak. That's how much he had emptied himself. Okay? So in summary, fashioned as a man is a phrase that was used. Likeness of a man. The form of a servant, which we just talked about, slave. Hebrews 10 verse 4, it says, For it is impossible, or it is not possible, that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body thou hast prepared for me. In other words, when Christ entered this world, the body that was prepared for him was human, just like me and you. Just like me and you, right? Now continuing, which body? Some people reason that the body that Jesus had was like a human body, but not really his body. Some people reason like it was the body that Adam was created in before he sinned, because in, uh, the scripture says, uh, likens Christ as the second Adam. So therefore they say, yeah, he came in a, it's not a divine body, but it's a a, a perfected human body as Adam had. Hebrews 2 verse 14. Now let's look at that. It says, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood. So we know the body that he took was flesh and blood. He bled. He died, right? So the same body that the children have. Now, who are the children? It's us. It's us, brethren. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he, Christ, himself, likewise, took part of the same. The same, brethren, the same body of flesh and blood that the children have, that we have. That through death, he might destroy him that hath power of death. That is the devil. Now understand that death would have no power over the body of Adam had he not sinned. So even if Christ came in the nature of Adam before he sinned, according to the law, Adam could not have died until he broke the law of God, which brought the penalty of death. So death would have no power over the sinless nature. The only nature that death has power over is the sinful nature. And so he came, he took part of the sinful nature so that he might die and through death, he would conquer the devil. Verse 15, it says, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. So the deliverance, brethren, is for those who are subject to death who are under, as it were, the curse of death. That's who he came to redeem. Continuing, it says, Romans 8, verse 3, for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sent in his own son, notice the phrase now, in the likeness of sinful flesh. Remember now, the phrase likeness of is not saying it is something similar. What it is saying, it is the exact replica of sinful flesh. Just like the likeness of God or the likeness of men. Here the apostle is saying the likeness of sinful flesh. He is 100% fully the same nature as I am. The likeness of sinful flesh. And for sin. Condemn sin in the flesh. Now, he could only condemn sin in the flesh that sin was in. So you cannot condemn sin in a flesh that sin was never in. So he had to take sinful flesh in order to conquer it in that same flesh. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. So in other words, so that we now can 
be overcomers over the flesh that we have to live in day by day by walking under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. That's what this is saying. Adam's nature. Now, Desire of Ages, page 48. Inspiration reads, it says, it would have been an almost infinite humiliation for the Son of God to take man's nature even when Adam stood in his innocence in Eden. So the humiliation that it would have caused to take Adam's sinless nature, she uses the word infinite humiliation to describe it. So to come and take my nature when it was perfect was an infinite humiliation to the God of heaven. But it says, but Jesus accepted humanity when the race had been weakened by 4,000 years of sin. Like every child of Adam, he accepted the results of the working of the great law of heredity. What were the results were shown in the history of his earthly ancestors. He came with such a heredity to share our sorrow and temptation and to give us an example of sinless life. So here inspiration is saying he didn't even take it close to Eden when men live six, seven, eight, nine hundred years. He took it after the human race had been weakened by 4,000 years of sin, brethren. That's the time that he took our nature. And it says he was subject to the law of heredity. When you look at the genealogy in Christ, you know, many of us, when we read the Bible in our early days and we would see which was the son of, which was the son of, which was the son of, it was boring to us. We read it and we're like, why is he going through all this list of genealogy? But as we become closer to Christ and he opens our eyes to the mysteries of his word, we see the, the, the blessings in listing out the genealogy of Christ. In his, in his genealogy, we find prostitutes. We find murderers. We find men of all walks of life. We find men like ourselves. And we have hope. Because we realize that if those men were in his genealogy, and he took on that nature and overcame in that nature, I have hope. That's what it says. And so he gave us an example of sinless life. Desire of Ages, page 117. It says, for 4,000 years, the race has been decreasing in physical strength, in mental power, and in moral worth. Christ took upon him the infirmities of the degenerate humanity. Only thus could he rescue man from the lowest depths of his degradation. In other words, he had to go to the deepest of the deep in order to redeem man. So there's not a place that man can, can fall to that the grace of God cannot reach him. Remember what Paul says. It says, where sin did abound, grace did much more. So as deep as we may have fallen in sin, the grace of Christ went deeper in order to redeem us. If we have in any sense, a more trying conflict than had Christ, then he would not be able to succor us, but our savior took humanity with all its liability. He took our nature with the possibility of yielding to temptation. We have nothing to bear for which Christ has not endured. So there's no struggle that we have there's no sin that we struggle with that Christ cannot help us to overcome, brethren. Ephesians 3, 14 to 19. The Apostle Paul, when he recognized this, he prayed for the believers in Ephesus. He says, for this cause, I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your heart by faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love. Here's that word again, love. 
that we may be able to understand, to comprehend with all the saints, what is the breadth, what is the length, what is the depth and height, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that we might be filled with all the fullness of God. So brethren, here, the Apostle Paul is overwhelmed. The Apostle Paul is saying, I'm praying for the Ephesian believers that they may understand how wide, how deep, how high, how long is the love of God. It is a love that passeth understanding. We cannot understand how deep God has gone for us to redeem us. And it says that when we truly look into that, we ourselves will be filled with all the fullness of God. We will be not just restored, but God will be, will come and take his abode within us. My beloved brother, this is Christ. Hebrews 2 verse 16. It says, for verily he took on him, he took not on him, sorry, the nature of angels. So not done, he didn't take the nature of Adam before he sinned. He didn't take the nature of angels, according to Hebrews 2, verse 17. But he took on him the seed of Abraham. Notice that, brethren. So according to his lineage, he came as a human descendant of Abraham. Wherefore, notice the highlighted red. In all things, brethren, it behooved him to make like unto his brethren. In other words, Christ took the time to be in all things just like me, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in all things pertaining to God. Notice that. For in that he himself had suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. Now, when Eve was brought to Adam, Adam made the statement. Adam says, this is now bone of my bone, and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman. In other words, it was a delightful idea that this creation of God is exactly like me. It's one just like me. It was so glorious to Adam to have one that was just like him. And here Christ, Romans 1 verse 3, it says concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was made of the seed of David, according to the flesh. In other words, he was not just a spiritual seed of David, it was according to descendant lineage. Galatians 4 verse 4, but when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, notice the next phrase, made of a woman, made under the law. In other words, all of us as human beings enter this world through a woman. And God's dear son entered in the same way, made of a woman, made under the law to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of son. Notice that, brethren. Now, under the law, the phrase, Romans 3 verse 19 tells us that to be under the law means that every mouth would be stopped. And all the world would become guilty before God. So to be under the law is to be under its condemnation. And according to the verse we just read in Romans and Galatians, that when the fullness of time was come, Christ did not come above the law, but he came under the law where cursed man was, right? Because to be under the law is to be under its curse. And so he came under the law to redeem us because that's where we were. Therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight. So in other words, Christ had to become guilty before God in order to redeem us. Now let's see if that was what happened, right? In Hebrews 2 verse 9, it says, But we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels. Remember, we just read that he was made so much better than the angels. Now we see him as man a little lower than the angels, right? Why? That he should taste death 
for every man. According to 1 Corinthians 15, the sting of death is sin. So in order for him to taste death for every man, he had to bear our sins, brethren. For it became of him for whom all things are and by whom all things are in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of our salvation perfect through suffering. For both he that sanctifieth, which is Christ, and they who are sanctified, us, are all of one. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brothers, brethren. So our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is one with us. In all things, he became like us in order to redeem us, to bring us back to a place where we can be adopted as sons and daughters of God once again. Now, the phrase even to the death of the cross, we just read that. And we wondered why. Paul would stress even the death of the cross. Now in Galatians 3 verse 13, Paul takes that up. And Paul says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Notice that because he came under the law where we were. He was made a curse for us. For it is written, curse is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Deuteronomy 21 verse 23 says, for he that is hanged is a curse of God. So even the manner in which Christ died, being crucified, was significant in that it represented one who was cursed of God. And that's exactly what Christ was. He took on our nature, our sins under the law, became a curse in order to redeem us. And even the manner of his death showed that he became a curse for us. Right? He was made a curse for us is written. Genesis 3 verse 17, right? When, when Adam sinned, the Bible says, Cursed is the ground for thy sake. Thorns and thistles shall it bring forth. So a sign of the curse was thorns and thistles. And in Mark 15 verse 17, what did our Lord and Savior Christ wore to the cross? The Bible says that they clothed him with purple and plated a crown of thorns and put it upon his head. So even the symbol of the curse of this earth, Christ wore it as a crown for you and me, brethren. He wore it as a crown. Continuing, 1st, 2nd Corinthians 5, verse 21. It says, for he have made him sin for us. There's no stronger verse that shows us the nature with which Christ took than this particular verse. It says, not only did he come in sinful flesh, the Bible says, for God the Father, for Christ, I mean, sorry, was made sin for us. There's no stronger words that could be used. He was made sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God. The exchange was full, brethren. He was made our nature. He was made our curse. He was made our sin. So that we can be made the righteousness of God. Hebrews 12 verse 2. It says looking unto Jesus the author and finisher of our, faith, of our faith. Who for the joy that was set before him. Endured the cross. Despising the shame. And is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. It was a shameful pathway. It was not a joyful road brethren. It was a shameful pathway. But it says, for the joy of the redemption, he despised the shame, took the cross so that he can redeem us, right? Desire of Ages, verse 57, it says, in the day of final judgment, every lost soul will understand the nature of his own rejection of the truth. Many people think that when they choose not to serve Christ, or, or when they choose to break the law of God, that, you know, it's just a choice of do's and don'ts, right? But inspiration is saying in the judgment, we will fully understand the nature of the rejection of truth. The cross will be presented and its real bearing will be seen by every mind that has been blinded by transgression. Before the vision of, the, of Calvary, with its mysterious victim, 
sinners will stand condemned. In other words, we will not lose out because of the sins we have committed, brethren. We will not suffer the consequence of, 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 of sin because just the sins we have committed. We would have suffered the consequence because of the rejection of the atonement and forgiveness provided. That is what will condemn us in the judgment, brethren. Not so much the sins we have committed, but the failure to allow the blood of Christ, the plan of redemption, to be visited upon our lives and so that our sins could be blotted out, could be forgiven, could be washed. We would suffer because we despise the sacrifice of Christ, brethren. And so in John 5, verse 22, it says, For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. So when we stand before Christ, we will have to answer to him as to the sacrifice that he has made and why we did not accept that sacrifice. Why was it in vain on our behalf? And that, brethren, we will not have any answer for. We will stand without a voice. Continuing, next of kin. Now, in the laws of redemption, for those of us who, have, who are familiar with the scripture, we know the story of, for example, Ruth in chapter three and four, right? The laws of redemption requires that for one to redeem another, that there are certain rules must, that must, must apply. In other words, he must first and foremost be a next of kin. And that is found in Leviticus 25, verse 25, and verse 47 to 49, that the law of redemption falls to the nearest person that is related to whoever needs to be redeemed. So in order for Christ to redeem us, he had to abide by the laws of redemption. And the laws of redemption says the, the one who is able to redeem us must be our nearest relative who is able. That's how the Bible puts it. The next of kin who is able, and the word who is able means who has the power or the wealth or who is fully capable of redeeming us. And so, brethren, Christ was fully able because he took our nature and became nearest to us. So not only was he able because he was all powerful because he was God, but he had to become man exactly like us. In every respect, he had to become our brethren. That's what the scripture says. He calls them in Hebrews 2, 11 to 13. He calls us brethren, brothers. So by becoming our next of kin, he is able to redeem us. And so in scriptures, the, the, the beauty of the plan of redemption is seen more and more, even in the minute details. You know, I was talking with a, a friend of mine in the week, and he is a Muslim. And we were talking about Christ. And he says, you know, I know you believe that Christ is God, but we don't believe he was God. We believe he was a prophet. We believe he was a good man. And as I started to look on it and I realized that had we had the same belief, we would be without hope. Because the plan of salvation shows that our salvation could not be paid for by one that was just a good man by one that was just a good prophet. He had to be fully God and fully man, brethren. And so for our gospel, we realize that the, the, the salvation provided by us, by Christ, who came as a sinless one, suffered and died, emptied himself of all divinity in order to die for us, puts us on a vantage ground because now, as it were, we are redeemed into the family of God. Inspiration in the faith I live by, it says, he is a brother in our infirmities, but not in possessing like passion. And now this is a word of caution because many people believe by us stressing the, human, the humanity of Christ, that he became sin for us, that he took on our nature, that we are saying that he himself was a sinner. That is not what we're saying, brethren. And so the word of caution is, he is our brother in infirmities, 
but not in possessing like passions. As the sinless one, his nature recoiled from evil. He endured struggles and torture of soul in a world of sin. His humanity made prayer a, necess a necessity and a privilege. He could have sinned. He could have fallen, but not for one moment was there in him an evil propensity. In taking upon himself man's nature in its fallen condition, Christ did not in the least participate in its sin. He was subject to the infirmities and weakness by which man is encompassed. He was touched with the feelings of our infirmities and was in all points tempted like as we are, yet he knew no sin. He was the lamb without blemish and without spot. Could Satan in the least particular have tempted Christ to sin, he would have bruised the Savior's head. But as we know, he was only able to bruise the Savior's heel by crucifying. Our high calling, Christ overcoming and obedience is that of a true human being. In our conclusion, we make many mistakes because of our erroneous views of the human nature of our Lord. When we give to his human nature a power that it is not possible for man to have in his conflict with Satan, we destroy the completeness of his humanity. So by giving to Christ the same humanity that we have, we are not making Christ less of a person. In fact, we are glorifying him because we are saying that he has not cheated in setting us an example, but he has taken everything that we have access to and overcame in that nature and now is able to show us step by step how we can walk the same path. The obedience of Christ to his father was the same obedience that is required of man. So if he had any special power, like inspiration says in three, three selected message, if Christ had any special power, which was not the privilege of man to have, Satan would have made capital of this matter. So when Christ came and he emptied himself, all the miracles he did, even when he raised the dead, was all power that is available to us as mankind in this process, in this plan of redemption, in overcoming. We do not have the power because we do not seek it as he did with his father. He was much in prayer. He was constantly leaning upon the father. The times when he could discern even thoughts of men was not because he was gifted with a power that we cannot have, but it was because he was under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And he lived in daily communion with his father. If we too, brethren, lived in that daily communion with God, we too have access to all that Christ had access to. One selected message, 341, justice demands that sin be not merely pardoned, but the death penalty must be executed. God in the gift of his only begotten son met both these requirements. By dying in man's stead, Christ exhausted the penalty and provided a pardon. Notice that he fulfilled to the max the penalty and requirement of the law and at the same time provided a pardon. And so the apostle Paul, when he recognized this, he says, God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of Christ. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believe it. And so brethren, when we look upon the cross of Christ, it's not something for us to hang our head in shame. It is power, brethren, because we recognize that it is the means by which the omnipotent shows us how much he loves us, shows us the depth to which he is willing to go to purchase us back when we had sold ourselves unto Satan. And this is love unselfish. This is love that will create within us a response of obedience, an obedience that is prompted by love. And so Charles Wesley, in his song, 
I pray that this will be the theme of our heart as we close today. The song is, And Can It Be, by Charles Wesley. It says, And can it be that I should gain an interest in my Savior's blood? Died he for me who caused this pain, for me who him to death pursued. Amazing love. How can it be that my God should die for me? He left his father's throne above, so free, so infinite his grace. He emptied himself of all but love and bled for Adam's helpless race. Tis mercy all, immense and free, for oh my God, it found out me. Long in prison, long my imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound in sin and nature's night. Thine eyes diffuse a quickening ray. I woke, the dungeon flamed with light. My chains fell off, my heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. He is recounting his conversion when his heart was given to Christ. And now he lives an overcoming life. He says, no condemnation now I dread. Jesus and all in him is mine. Remember the scripture says, in us will be fulfilled all the fullness of God. All that is in Christ is mine. Alive in him, my living head, and clothed in righteousness divine. Bold, I approach the eternal throne and claim the crown through Christ, my own. I trust and pray, brethren, that you would have been blessed by this short talk on the... the, the plan of salvation, the redemption. And I trust that as we look more into this intense subject, our hearts, like that of Charles Wesley, will be lifted to say, amazing love, how can it be that my God should die for me? Please bow your heads in prayer with me. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your love. Such amazing love that sinful as we are, enemies of God, without hope, you, O oh God, have taken a journey that caused you to empty yourself of all, to suffer shame and dis to be despised, O oh Lord, to be afflicted in order to purchase for me a salvation at so great a cost. O oh God, help me that the love that you have shown to us will create within us a wellspring, O oh Lord, that will draw us to you in love, that will overflow within us, that we cannot help but love you and obey you. We cannot help but share this love with others. Help us, O oh God, that we'll see sin for what it really is, that every time we choose to do what is right and pleasing in your sight, we are honoring you. And every time we choose to do what is wrong in your sight, O oh Lord, we are crucifying you afresh. We appreciate you, Jesus. We thank you for your Holy Spirit and we glorify you, our Father. Forgive us of our sins and bless us the remainder of this Holy Sabbath, we pray in Jesus' loving, wonderful, and holy name. Amen.